Good. First of all, th there's been a little bit of, of, of fudge, maybe losing things in translation in the in the title. I've simplified it here. Uh, this talk is uh, intended to follow to some degree the other two. Uh, the first one was about the typographic context uh, for uh, typeface design. Uh, the second one was about the work context, and there's a bit of a filtering thing. The first one essentially says typeface design actually is difficult, requires quite a bit of work and research. Uh, the people who survive that talk might go to the second one and say, okay, where do I work now? Uh, what are the possibilities for someone to do something with this um, desire to work in typeface design? Those who might have survived the second talk and have not sort of given up in despair might now come to this. When you say, okay, I'm really determined to do this. I, I'm content with a, a life of a lot of uh, boring staring at screens and perhaps not becoming a millionaire. Uh, and what do I do? Because so much of what uh, we do is based on uh, imitation, uh, learning through practice and not necessarily very much documentation of what we do. And that is frustrating for me. So the, the key problem we're facing is how does a designer internalize how do they learn from the stuff they experience they look and so on and then how do they make decisions and there's a, a balance there between implicit knowledge and explicit knowledge the stuff that you absorb through being a, a literate uh, reading agent of a typographic environment uh, in a society that produces text that you interact with whether you, you are conscious or not uh, that means I look at something uh, intentionally when I'm reading it, but also I'm walking in the street and I'm looking at signs and so on. All of these influence me without necessarily me being aware. And then I have to translate all of this into some sort of conscious decision making because I am making typefaces that will in turn populate the social typographic environment. So the teaching or feedback or um, self-reflective practice of the designer stands with one foot in this implicit knowledge and the other foot with translation of that into an explicit knowledge. This is nothing serious. It's not rocket science. It's been discussed a lot in education circles. It's been discussed a lot in other design-related disciplines that have a social dimension. Typeface design, by being a relatively new field, is actually relatively poor in uh, literature and discussions that are documented uh, in this area. So maybe this is part of this. So I showed yesterday and day before a couple of pictures like this, which look cool, uh, but then tell you nothing about the design process. Because uh, you're thinking, okay, what are these people looking at? Uh, this tells you nothing. These are beautiful images of essentially zero content in terms of helping you understand what choices are these people making when they're looking, say, at a very large letter form on a screen or a series of letters on a screen and so on. Similarly, when I showed uh, examples how people talk about their work, uh, you don't necessarily know what the annotations mean. Uh, what is the designer thinking in order to make these notes? When they say something that says wider, wider in relation to what? Narrower in relation to what? Heavier in relation to what? And this kind of very relative language is pervasive in design. That's not a bad thing, but it means that we are sharing some common foundational knowledge that we're sort of winking at each other when I say, you know what, when I say wider, I mean essentially in relation to the stroke thickness or the other letter, and we can share this understanding. How do you build this? How do you make this explicit so that new designers can understand this faster and better and more clearly? and not necessarily have to spend quite a lot of time um, maybe in imitation of work or going down blind alleys or imitating what they've been told without necessarily critically accepting it. Uh, and I'm fully expecting Stefan to give me a hard time for me showing his picture of him looking not at a letter form. This is essentially two-dimensional sculpture that he's contemplating clearly. Uh, not very helpful in understanding what makes a good question mark or not, even though I like that particularly. And then you see a lot of stuff online that is not necessarily very helpful. So a beautiful image which says at the bottom, quick style range testing. No, kidding. I have no idea. In the 25 years of doing things, I have no idea how you can actually test the style ranges with just two letters uh, in outline and so on. So a lot of the stuff is actually quite opaque. And my reflection on this starts from situations like this, hey Dot, if you've seen this, uh, where you're talking to people 
and you're thinking, how can I talk to them? How can I ensure that there is consistency in what I'm discussing? And I have to say, this is a good case scenario because a scenario like this, where you're meeting people regularly, allows you to build this foundation on knowledge. But the goal would be to be able to give feedback to people without imposing your own style or taste, uh, to do it equally across projects by different students or different uh, designers or whatever, and to do it consistently across sessions. And uh, teachers will be very familiar of the mental stress of performing equally well at nine o'clock in the morning and at four o'clock in the afternoon, where your brain is essentially melting and you really need to be able to do justice to the student who comes later in the day rather than the beginning. So you need some sort of mental framework for this. That uh, needs to be quite separate from means of making, the applications that people use, the technology so on. It needs to focus on visual decisions. Uh, I think that isolates it from uh, the trap of talking for very specifics. And also with typefaces, allow people to design typefaces whose brief mutates over time or might find different applications and can be more open-ended in how people build uh, a decision system. Uh, what is the really test case for these are things like one-off crits. These things happen in uh, conferences and so on. Uh, my first very scary uh, in terms of this was in 2013 in Amsterdam when I realized that uh, a few people would be showing their work without having any experience personally of any of the three people who were giving them crits, let alone it being done in public. So then you don't have a shared language, you don't have a shared experience of giving feedback, and you need to be very precise in the kind of language you're using. I'm not even going into the problems of the diversity of education backgrounds or language backgrounds that people might have in these scenarios. So in order to do not just respect the project, but also respect the designer who's bringing work, you need to be consistent in your language and your approach in how you evaluate things. Uh, I'll drop in a shout out uh, for Victor Goldney's PhD work, which is approaching completion. He's doing a lot of work on uh, documenting the and researching the design process for italics, but this relates also to typefaces in um, more generally, and it should be, uh, I don't want to put pressure in, should be public <laughs> within the next few months. Uh, and it's an extremely interesting piece of work in that area. Uh, I'm also plugging Lewis McGuffey's uh, typeface, which I'm using for some of the uh, slides here, Columba. So, uh, I've come up with a series of headlines or pointers that you can essentially distribute. When this first started as a list about 10 years ago, this was much longer. Over time, it becomes shorter and neater so that it will be more uh, handy, digestible. That, the first has to do with looking at typefaces within briefs. Again, understanding what are the typographic conditions. This relates a lot to the first talk I gave and building a set of limitations. For typeface designers working on their own, this is often a huge problem because by training, they're used to having a given brief. Somebody, a client, a teacher, and so on, gives them something and says, respond to this. Whereas if you're doing a typeface from scratch, you have yourself to develop the limitations within which you are operating. And that is often quite a big challenge. And the only way to do it efficiently is to look at a environment of use of the typeface, understand the typographic conditions for it, and then from that derive certain limitations, which might have to do with range of optical sizes, it might have to do with line spacing, and so on. Uh, then from that you can build a, for want of a better word, a, a dossier of peer groups, uh, typefaces that may already be used in that environment. And that is not so that you are consciously influenced by them, but so that you recognize explicitly that your audience, be they their final readers or your clients, will be aware to some degree of these things. And the patterns set up by these other typefaces will uh, influence how you make decisions. So if you're designing something for immersive, say, fiction reading, then you cannot avoid the patterns that have been set up by things like Minion and Erhard and Sabon and so on, simply because if you go into any mainline bookshop in the English-speaking world, these typefaces will account for something like 50 to 60% of all the printed books in the fiction section. So you have to take these things into account. Uh, 
So constructing templates, constructing uh, sample documents that actually represent the conditions of use. And that is important because you need as quickly as possible to be able to drop in a, a situation where you look at your typeface being developed uh, in typographic conditions that are similar to what you're looking at. So I could not possibly make a decision on say the length of ascenders and descenders in a typeface uh, without having some uh, inclination of the line spacing that I might, might want this typeface to be used in. Uh, of course, there are good examples of typefaces uh, with multiple options. Uh, Trini Day, I did this, is a very good example, which explicitly recognizes that not a single solution is possible, but depending on the typographic conditions, you might want longer ascenders or descenders. And indeed, uh, as a footnote, recent developments might allow you to have some sort of flexibility in this, depending on typographic conditions. But to be aware that this is a thing that you need to take into account is quite central. And there's a very big difference between a, an example like this and an example like this, where the typeface does not operate in its own typographic paragraph uh, texture, but actually always in contrast with other typefaces at different optical sizes and different uh, textures. That is essential to recognize that in this case, the typeface for the text essentially is part of a typographic palette that the designer needs to uh, arrange and orchestrate and therefore it cannot have any choice being made about itself on its own. So a very good example would be to use something like this with existing typefaces, for example, for headings, in order to make comparisons. Then the specific uses that complicate typography, this particular case for play where traditionally there would be a lot of white space around, there might be a lot of complex typesetting with uh, small caps and so on, numbers are integrated in the text but are not meant to be dominant, these would inform the decisions. So again, how prominent are my small caps? Uh, are they small caps or are they mid caps? Uh, are my numbers heavier or lighter and so on? Cannot be answered conclusively until I have some idea of how the typeface might be used. And I will note that both of the two text-heavy examples I showed had a background that slightly knocked down the contrast between the typeface and the, the white of the screen. That's not least because if something is printed, the conventions for printing are for paper that is less white than the very bright, such a sort of white bleached paper that we see for laser printers, which is intended to saturate colors, whereas uh, light or printing will actually have a softer contrast. So recognizing that the rendering might actually be influenced by the background is part of the design process. And you can have different degrees of backgrounds for this. And then the planning of the family styles. Again, this relates very much to the context. There is no such thing as a good enough bold or a heavy enough bold on its own. It's a heavy enough for this or heavy enough for that. So in a case like this, where I might have bolds that are structural in modest text sizes above uh, an entry with not a lot of text below and a reasonable on the white space, the correct answer to bold enough might be very different from a bold that is meant to be used as a heading in a large size and so on. Again, going back to conditions uh, that make sense and are uh, specifically tailored to typographic documents. So the best preparation for a typeface project would be looking at peers, again, in combination with examples of typefaces in use for the documents that might be intended. Uh, this is a very good example again, and it's connected to things we'll talk about later, of a move towards uh, structured documents that have a series of annotations or series of timestamps and so on, structural elements that accompany bits of text in a secondary structure at a much higher density than things that were printed. So for example, if I'm referencing a printed document, I have chapters and page numbers that are fixed by the materiality of the object and I can use them to refer to. Whereas if I'm looking at something online, I might only have timestamps or things like that to refer to this, and these need to accompany the text wherever it goes. So if I'm looking at the complement of a typeface, I cannot really see very much until I start interrogating what are the options and what is each of these things intended for. On its own, a display like this is essentially quite opaque and not very helpful for the design. I need to ask what are these things for. So, how do these things get used? 
am I going to be limited by existing decisions that the users might make? Am I going to be limited to conventions that are emerging about mapping onto CSS weights and so on? This is a very interesting thing that's been happening for over 10 years now, where time is beginning to recognize the almost nine uh, stopping points in CSS weights, and a lot of families are beginning to adjust their weighting for this. However, a typographic uh, examination of documents might show you that the steps between degrees of weight that document designs prefer is not a linear progression across eight or nine steps, but something that maybe is non-linear and has a heavier change between, say, uh, the middle weights would be book, medium, regular, and so on, uh, and the bold weights for structure. So things to be looking at, um, small list of stuff, the key dimensions within the body. Uh, this is one of the starting factors, and what I mean by key dimensions is less the horizontal bars when I'm looking at the ascenders and descenders, and I'm ignoring the descenders for now, I'll explain this later, but mostly the stroke thickness and the difference between the key strokes in the form. Uh, again, I'm, uh, as I've uh, qualified in the first talk, I'm focusing only on the Latin script for economy, uh, of time and the discussion, uh, but a lot of the principles I'm talking about, I think, are script agnostic. Uh, and of course, then specific dimensions, like in the Latin, the uh, the break of the x height band by the horizontal division of uh, the counters for the A, E, and S. These things are quite central. Now, if I say I'm designing a text typeface, I can look at the thickness of the stroke, and I will find that there's a very long convention of strokes uh, existing in the thickness range of between one to five or one to six, in terms of six times uh, as high in that end as, uh, as wide. And then the counter in between being somewhere around twice the stroke thickness, uh, maybe two and a half times, depending on the, if the type is a bit on the light side, or gradually uh, coming closer to even one and a half, 175 times the stroke thickness. There's no design decision there. This is just a decision made through observing the context and understanding that when people say a regular typeface for text, essentially they mean a typeface that has a proportion of strokes about one to five and a half, one to six, and the key strokes vertically separated by about 175 uh, or two times the stroke thickness. That's not design. That's just recognizing the genre of the typeface it's in. The design would happen in the handling of the curved strokes, the modulation of the strokes, and so on. We're not really doing design at this stage at all. Design begins to happen when you look at how strokes are modulated and the homogeneity between them. How much are they repeated patterns or dissimilar? So I'm looking at not just the angles of stress, but I'm looking at the range at which uh, strokes are modulated, the variation between them, and so on. So whether something has some discernible angle of stress uh, uniformly across the typeface or just some letters is a key characteristic and that would be a pure design decision. What is increasingly returning to typefaces and I think for the better is the modulation of the vertical strokes in the Latin script which has been for too long I think straight jacketed into fairly straight lines. This was not the case necessarily uh, both in uh, metal typefaces and in photo typesetting. Uh, but was eliminated in early digital years. And now we begin to see typefaces that have much more subtle uh, curvature in the vertical strokes. That itself presents a challenge because you need to understand how you handle this differently for longer strokes and shorter strokes, uh, but it is something that opens up design possibilities. The alignments on the horizontal and vertical dimensions are actually quite critical for, uh, for typefaces and often um, underappreciated simply because people work in an environment that has some existing guidelines and points stick on guidelines. However, something like the X-Height is not a point alignment guide, it's a visual alignment guide. It's entirely plausible that you have a typeface where not a single control point aligns exactly on the line of the X-Height. And I would probably argue that a good typeface probably doesn't do that. Uh, instead, once you have determined the curvature of the in strokes and the curves on letters like the N and the P, you would go back and redefine your X height as a visual alignment and then go and design 
your diagonal letters once that has been refined. Uh, often uh, people are, will see typefaces where maybe the X height was left in an early stage of decision and then the diagonal letters were made and they will appear quite higher than curved letters like the N and the P simply because the instroke, for example, of the N and the P were done uh, with a longer inclination later and the V uh, was left to appear higher. So this kind of recognition of the sequence uh, in the design decisions, which actually impact key dimensions like horizontal alignments and vertical alignments, is actually central to the process. Then we're cascading down decisions that introduce more original elements, the typeface where the designer can actually place more of their own ideas. So the degree to which uh, strokes begin or end and are uniform or not, the degree to which these things maintain some imitation to tools or not, uh, or are homogeneous or not. These is where places where the design have much more influence in modifying the typeface and also to adapting the typeface to different optical sizes, weights and so on. So whether these features will grow in accordance with the stroke thickness or might uh, say maintain a lower rate of growth in higher weights is a key design decision that you can identify and isolate. Then the connections between elements. Again, this is a key design uh, stage where people will look at things. When, so when you're looking at typhus, you can look at whether these things are handled uniformly or whether these things have uh, degrees of uh, say difference that are related to tools or are intentional and so on. And I'm showing different optical sizes here also to show how these things might differentiate across. So structures like the joint of the D, which might work with a very swelling stroke, very well in a large size, might not work that way in a smaller optical size and so on. So again, the relative judgment about these things that's being made, depending on the context of use, is central. Then finally, the integration of exceptions, where designers have letters, or for instance, where they can introduce quite a lot of variation or homogeneity, features that are supposed to be related but are nowhere near identical. So in this case, this idea of a swelling stroke that uh, terminates a movement uh, is something that can be treated more uh, homogeneously or not. In this case, we can see the tail of the Y, for example, has quite a gentle swelling, whereas the arm of the R has a quite a pronounced uh, tapering in its joint. This will introduce an intentional variation in the texture, and that is part of the design decision. Uh, designer would make. So far so good, but what are key challenges in implementing these things? Uh, there's quite a lot of uh, areas where designers, especially learning designers, face problems. And one of the uh, most challenging one is the scale at which people work. So you're staring at a letter form on screen, a very large size, it doesn't tell you very much about how it's being used, even though you could see it with other letter forms next to it. It is not a realistic typographic uh, environment. I think that is one of uh, the most uh, challenging problems for new designers to solve, exactly because building the skill of understanding how something that you interact with at very large size will behave at smaller sizes requires quite a lot of reflective examination of documents, of proofs, and so on. I would also like to see, in this case, integrated testing documents in applications. For example, it is quite clunky at the moment to produce a, an instance of a typeface and immediately see it in a live HTML page or immediately see it in, within the application that you're designing in complex typographic templates. The uh, key uh, challenge for new designers has to do with very gentle curves. And I mentioned the uh, return of, uh, sort of wasted or tapered uh, downstrokes in uh, Latin type design. So when people need to design very gentle curves, these bits are much more challenging than the horizontal swelling strokes. Where well, there's quite a lot of change in the modulation, things are much easier to visualize and do. Uh, but at very shallow angles and very uh, gentle tangents, then uh, the busy acres seem to offer quite a lot of problems for people. So in these cases, it's something that needs a special attention and also highlighting in the design process.
A key challenge also is what I would call fudging, that people, when they're sketching, this is an exercise, for an exercise uh, you know, that a pencil sketch is a very forgiving tool and allows you to create ideas without making fixed uh, decisions about boundaries and so on. And it's also a tool, like a lot of writing tools, if you're using a pen or a brush, that form strokes from the inside out. They essentially build a stroke and then populate that stroke with thicknesses around it. Uh, when you're moving from that kind of stage to an outline, you're essentially flipping the process and you're creating something that has to have a very defined border and very clear transitions between straight elements or very shallow curves and curves, simply because of the nature of busy curves and the tools we're using. That is consistently a problem for designers where you might want to go back and look at their sketches, their intentions, and try to see where the translation to something that is uh, much more fixed in term uh, fails to capture the movement or the vitality of this. What is uh, extremely difficult for designers to capture also in Bézier is the transition from a fairly tight curve to a very shallow curve, and that is often a problem. Now, uh, I mentioned this problem in the testing. I think this is one of the key challenges for font design application makers, that uh, instead of adding more features for you know, how to do more shapes, there should be integrated uh, live in-browser testing or live uh, complex document trees. So I could, should be able to upload an InDesign uh, template and, and in a folder, and then my program Glyphs app should be able to render the font I'm working on using that template in a separate preview window instead of having something that is just non-typographic. I think that would be much more helpful for designers. And it would also be an explicit recognition that designers increasingly are further away from a lot of the document genres that they're expected to produce uh, typefaces for. And by this, I mean that uh, if I'm looking at typographic conventions, this goes back nearly 10 years. It's an example where a typographic designer might have a very good awareness for how typefaces can create connections of continuity and structure between different uh, elements in a spread. Whereas now we're in a situation where a lot of these conventions actually don't exist. We have a mutation of most documents going from multi-column or spread structure into columns with bottomless columns uh, of documents which exist in multiple instances of scale and rendering and more importantly have multiple instances themselves along a time axis because that will introduce elements of annotation relating to specific parts of the documents or versions of the document that are being reworked over time. So the typographic structures that were developed over centuries for print-based spreads I find and are quite inadequate uh, for answering the problems of instances of documents that have multiple versions of themselves and multiple layers of annotations that are embedded in the typography. We are beginning to see some standards developing in this. They mostly have to do with weight. That is not particularly helpful as a convention beyond a certain point. Uh, but the association of typefaces with documents that have multiple instances and are dynamic needs still work in defining this. And again, a lot of typeface designers might come from an environment where this uh, is something that they're more familiar with rather than the more uh, conventional typographic structures that the books that they're reading uh, about type might rely on. And I want to give an example for, uh, as opposed to for how to do a little bit more methodical uh, say development for this. I, I showed very few letters and I only showed lowercase because I find that the typeface, unless it's it lowercase is developed, then numbers, uh, capitals and so on are not particularly helpful. You need the bedrock of the typographic texture, but that's not very helpful because not all lowercase letters are the same. So if I were developing something, assuming say, for English, then I can have a structure where I can look at the frequency of elements in a letter form, in a typeface, then to uh, define development sequence that I will be working in two specific test documents. So if I'm working for English, I can first of all look at the uh, complements of the lowercase letters, arrange them in some sort of 
sequence that will help um, categorize them and also I can see how the decisions will be uh, more similar. But if I then look at the frequencies of letters, I will see that some letters matter much more than others. And if I arrange my letter forms by the frequency, I might get something like this that says, okay, maybe these letters at the top are the more important. However, if I combine the two approaches, then I will get something a bit more interesting because if I look at a combination of the frequency of letters and also the similarity of elements between them, then I will get a sequence like this. And this essentially tells me if I'm designing for English, then essentially uh, these letters are overwhelmingly giving me the texture of uh, the text that people will read and all the other letters are coming much in much lower frequencies and will essentially just give a bit of uh, color to the to the texture this also explains why the impression we get in looking at an english text is one of repeated uh, vertical strokes and the round counters it's simply because these elements are repeated a lot in the language and i can of course, do this kind of analysis for any European language that use the Latin script or other languages and so on, and have essentially a test suite of sequences for beginning to work in most languages. Now, I'm pretty sure that there will be quite a lot of overlap in them, but there are useful differences and we'll often see different frequencies, say for the Y in Spanish or the W in Polish, and these will make a big impact. So they should be in there. So this is just for English. But if I'm working with that, then I can just start with these four letters that I showed, and that will allow me to have a pretty good idea of the decisions I'm likely to make for most of the letters uh, in uh, the highest frequency. I use a simple word like this, and then I've pretty much covered enough uh, shapes so that I can do reasonable tests with my typeface. And here is a good test document actually we're working on this with uh, moda a few years back uh, of for progressive testing uh, of the spacing of the typeface so in the first column we have only a few characters in this typeface the ones that are have both very frequently repeated elements but also do not need a lot of uh, spacing intervention in this case no kerning and so on we have dropped the g in this case because we were testing uh, the darkness of the g but essentially the first paragraph will give us a good idea of how dark the typeface is and will allow us to space the first few letters and make sure that the default pairings uh, control the gray of the uh, of the typeface without us needing to worry too much about things like kerning and so on then in the second column, we add a few more characters. They will uh, allow us to increase the complexity of the texture, but not worry too much still about kerning and so on. And once that set of letters is uh, refined and so on, then in the third character, third column, we have all the letters in the, in the lowercase, which includes diagonals and so on, which will complicate the texture quite a lot. But then by that stage, we know that all the other letters have been balanced between them in terms of weight, in terms of the proportions, in terms of the spacing, and we can focus only on the additional letters, in this case, the diagonals and so on. So this kind of more systematic analysis and progression, first of the context, then of defining rules for looking at things uh, across uh, the project in relation to its context and also uh, in a cascade of decisions uh, within the typeface so that we look at first the elements that create homogeneity then the elements that create uh, identity and then having a systematic engagement with test documents that allow us to confirm these decisions and be as quick as possible in jumping through uh, decisions is quite essential in being efficient in how we're working uh, now i should add that a lot of documents do exist internally for uh, these kinds of value testing, but they're often uh, internal corporate documents uh, or they're historical documents for specific processes. Whereas uh, it would be really good if more and more of these uh, templates for testing and process are actually made uh, publicly available. Uh, I will thank you for your patience.